The East Coast was battered over the last few days by another hurricane, this one named Nicole. The storm has been estimated to have caused hundreds of millions of dollars of damage to homes and infrastructure in Florida alone. And yet, standing resolutely firm on the edge of the state was the towering 212-foot-tall white and orange Space Launch System rocket with its Orion capsule secured on top. With a launch date set for less than a week away, NASA and the whole world crossed their fingers and hoped that the rocket would withstand its first stress test. And now that the clouds have parted, NASA has finally made an announcement as to whether Artemis 1, the first crucial flight test of the SLS, will in fact take place. Today, I'll go over that announcement, as well as the other top stories happening in the space industry today. Welcome to the Undiscovered Country. Hello, and welcome to the Undiscovered Country. I'm your host, Bryant A.M. Baker. Today, I'll present the top five most important things happening in the world of space. Let's get started. Number five. Divers searching for a World War II era aircraft near the Bermuda Triangle for a documentary being put together by the History Channel just discovered a piece of an entirely different sort of vessel, part of the U.S. Challenger space shuttle that exploded soon after takeoff in 1986. The team described it as a stunning find, and totally unexpected. The marine biologist Mike Barnett, who led the team, said the significance of this large section of Challenger's structure was readily apparent. We recognized the necessity of bringing this find to the immediate attention of NASA. Challenger burst apart just dozens of seconds after launching from Florida, killing seven crew members, including the teacher, Krista McCullough, who had won a national screening. The Challenger segment preserved remarkably well at the bottom of the Atlantic. NASA confirmed on Thursday that it was one of the largest pieces ever discovered from the space disaster. The visible part of the shuttle is about 4.5 by 4.5 meters, but the piece extends under the sand, and it is still unknown what the total size is. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson confirmed the find in a public statement. While it has been nearly 37 years since seven daring and brave explorers lost their lives aboard the Challenger, this tragedy will forever be seared in the collective memory of our country. For millions around the globe, myself included, January 28, 1986 still feels like yesterday. This discovery gives us an opportunity to pause once again to uplift the legacies of the seven pioneers we lost and to reflect on how this tragedy changed us. At NASA, the core value of safety is and must forever remain our top priority, especially as our missions explore more of the cosmos than ever before. Though a sad reminder of this disaster, it is incredibly exciting to see a piece of that spacecraft be found. Though an unhappy one, reminders of our shared history in space are ones that definitely must be cherished. Number 4 India has officially thrown its hat in the world of commercial spaceflight. A company called Skyroot is planning to perform a launch on November 15th. The company is one based out of the Indian city Hyderabad and is a, fo a four-year-old space startup. Skyroot Aerospace CEO and co-founder Pawan Kumar Chandana told Indian media last week that a launch window between November 12th and 16th has been notified by authorities, the final date being confirmed based on weather conditions. 
The company has named its rocket Vikram after Vikram Sarabhai, who established India's space program. The launch will make Skyroot the country's first private company to send its own rocket into space. In 2021, India's Narendra Modi government launched a program to promote collaboration between private and public players in space technology. Skyroot was the first startup to sign a deal with the Indian Space Research Organization to launch rockets. Naga Bharat Dhaka, Chief Operating Officer of Skyroot Aerospace, said in a statement that the Vikram 5 rocket is a single-stage suborbital launch vehicle which would carry three customer payloads and help test and validate the majority of the technologies in the Vikram series of space launch vehicles. The company is designing three rockets uh, in its Vikram series to launch small payloads. Although Skyroot's Vikram will mark the beginning of private launches in Indian sp the Indian space sector, other firms are not far behind. Earlier this week, for instance, Chennai-based startup Agnikul Cosmos test-fired its engine for 15 seconds at an ISRO facility. Additionally, the Indian Express recently reported that the Indian Space Agency's small satellite launch vehicles are also likely to be manufactured and operated by players soon. Number 3 A new Chinese startup is attempting to develop its own reusable stainless steel rockets, apparently taking inspiration from SpaceX's next-generation Starship vehicle. Beijing-based Space Epic is aiming to build and launch these stainless steel rockets, which will be powered by engines that burn a mix of methane and liquid oxygen propellants, just like Starship's Raptors. Space Epic initially wants to develop a 210-foot-tall rocket capable of launching 14,330 pounds to a 684-mile-high sun-synchronous orbit. The new Chinese vehicle will therefore be much smaller and less powerful than SpaceX's Starship, which, when fully stacked, stands 394 feet tall and will be able to send 110 tons into low Earth orbit. But it is still a very ambitious and challenging endeavor. The company is planning to buy the methane engines from another Chinese startup, engine maker Jijo Yunjian. China already has a number of launch startups, which have been emerging since a 2014 government policy opening the space sector to private capital. What do you think about this, citizens? Is this intellectual theft, or is this just using good common sense? SpaceX is well known for flouting the normal patterns of patents on various intellectual property. Is China taking advantage of the system, or are they using the system as it was meant to be used? Let me know. Number two. Several major space companies, including SpaceX and Relativity, are, are urging the U.S. Federal Communications Commission to stick to regulating spectrum usage and to leave everything else alone. The companies all seem to agree that there's plenty that the FCC could and should do to support in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing, also known as ISAM, missions that sit squarely within its regulatory bounds. The FCC requested comments from industry after it opened a new proceeding on ISAM in August. SpaceX, Relativity, and others said in their responses that the FCC should bring its considerable authority to bear on issues related to spectrum use and licensing, and only issues relating to spectrum use and licensing. The SpaceX response stated specifically that the commission must handle this potentially important but still nascent industry with care, exercising caution not to unintentionally stifle innovation by stepping outside the authority expressly delegated to it by Congress. Relativity Space and the Industry Association Commercial Spaceflight Federation separately argued that the FCC's involvement in issues outside of those related to spectrum could result in duplicative approval processes. These could be especially challenging for smaller startups and newer space entrants to navigate. 
In September, the FCC had updated rules related to spacecraft deorbiting and orbital debris management, voting that satellite operators must deorbit satellites in low Earth orbit five years after their mission concludes, rather than 25. But such actions have raised questions whether the FCC has sufficient authority to pass such rules. As of yet, Congress has made no movement toward expanding or extending the FCC's authority. But this begs the question as to the extent that the spectrum or any other portion of outer space activities should be regulated. Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty makes nations responsible for all activities in space, even private ones. So clearly, regulation is required. But the level of control the FCC holds over these activities is still an open question. So what do you think? Do you buy into the laissez-faire school of regulation and say the less the better? Or has the modern boom in space activity changed your outlook and made you believe that space needs to be more heavily regulated? I would love to hear from you. Number one. After initial visual inspections, NASA said on Thursday that its new Mega Moon rocket apparently suffered no major damage after Hurricane Nicole hit Florida. But employees must conduct further checks on site as soon as possible to confirm the initial assessment, said Jim Free, the associate administrator at the U.S. Space Agency. Mr. Free said, Camera inspections show very minor damage, such as loose cock and tears in weather coverings. The team will conduct additional on-site walk-down inspections of the vehicle very soon. Nicole made landfall Wednesday night on Florida's Atlantic coast as a Category 1 hurricane. Mr. Free stated that NASA took the decision to keep Orion and SLS at the launch pad very seriously. Reviewing the data in front of us and making the best decision possible with high uncertainty in predicting the weather four days out. With the unexpected change to the forecast, returning to the vehicle assembly building was deemed to be too risky in high winds, and the team decided that the launch pad was the safest place for the rocket to weather the storm. Freeset wind sensors detected gusts up to 82 miles per hour along the rocket's body, which is within the rocket's capability to, with, to withstand. He acknowledged that NASA likely would have kept the SLS in the, the VAB had it known before the November 4 rollout how Hurricane Nicole would develop. If we knew on the night before we were rolling out, he said, that it was going to be a hurricane, we probably would have stayed in the VAB. NASA is moving ahead with the next Artemis 1 launch attempt on November 16th after finding no major repairs required to the SLS and Orion from the hurricane. Mr. Free explained that right now, there's nothing preventing us from getting to the 16th. We do have some work to do. That work, he said, includes cutting away some of that loose cock known as RTV on the Orion launch abort system that isn't needed for flight. Uh, a rain cover in one SLS engine was torn and is being fixed, while water that pooled in the crew access arm was removed. And an umbilical le leading from the launch tower to Orion came off and a tray and was replaced. If, in fact, it, it ends up happening that November 16th launch will occur despite two hurricanes, countless delays, billions of dollars in overcost, and the disappointment of a lot of former supporters of the program. But if in fact Artemis 1 kickstarts a return to the moon and the ushering in of a new chapter in deep space presence and utilization, it may all one day be seen as worth it. But what do you think? Are we on the precipice of a new era? Or are these hurricanes really signs from above that SLS and even Artemis is a losing ticket? Send me your comments. Thank you so much for joining me. Links to all the stories, as always, are in the description. The world of space law policy and business is changing every day. If you missed what happened last time, be sure to check out the video I did covering it. I would love to hear your thoughts on everything that we talked about here today, and I'll see you again next time.